on Elohim, you might have been looking up scriptures, and I'm sort of going through some of the Psalms. I don't, you know, I, I don't really plan on, there's a lot of them, um, but I'll see how, how many we do. But here's what I, I had a thought. I had a thought that uh, it would be interesting, some of you, if you shared what you have gotten from the Psalms per, pertaining to Adonai. And um, I've already heard from several people. Um, let's see, Emmy is just blown away and so excited over Psalm 57, where she <laughs> saw Adonai. And she, so she wrote it and shared it all up. And of course, you know that uh, Alana did the same thing. Um, and hers was, um, what was it? Oh, Psalm 30, 35. Psalm 35. And she really went through that whole thing. And, uh, and then she mailed that to me, emailed that to me. And um, let's see, I know that Kelly and Deb and several others have been searching in different Psalms also. So I just thought if it was, you know, that that might be interesting to uh, s hear others that what they're getting in relationship to it. So I'm giving you an open door if you would just uh, text me this code, 3701. No, I'm sorry. There is no code. <laughs> if you'll, if you'll just send me a text and say um, that that you have been searching, that there might be a particular psalm that you've been searching in, uh, in relationship to this, and that you'd be willing to share what you've seen, small or large. You'd be willing to share that. And uh, if you do that, then uh, we could have a a time where. Um, we could hear from the body. We could hear the Word of God along the same exact line and see what the Spirit of God's showing us. And I believe that He's showing us some good stuff. And, and just like I said, some of these people that have been texting me with uh, these things, you know, it's been good. And it's also been really refreshing to see what they're, how they're seeing Him in different verses and different uh, Psalms. So think about that. If you'd like to join in, um, you could even um, maybe wait or, or maybe look into some of those psalms this week and just see if you find Adonai in any one of them and, and what you might just see, maybe even at a glance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, we are, um, we are still in... Genesis 18, but that's where we really, I mean, it was in Genesis 15 that we first heard the name Adonai. And uh, Genesis 18 is the first time that we hear it from Abraham that when he, and in and, and 15 it was Abraham speaking. Um, in uh, 18, he's not just using the name or speaking words to make it sound spiritual. He got it. He got it in 18. He got it. And so, um, uh, but what happened at that same time as we began to discover that was that um, we literally discovered that Adonai is the name of the one of the Godhead or, or two uh, or three. I don't, you know, I've, we've seen examples in Psalm 2 of two people being uh, oppressed and the Holy Spirit being the one who was the Adonai. Um, so um, uh, we've been, you know, s looking at that more across the scriptures. And in so doing, we have discovered that this name, this name is specifically a name that you call upon God with when you are going through the sufferings of Christ. When you are going through the corridor. 
and uh, even as I'm searching, I'm learning more, and I I uh, I make uh, just depending on how this goes. If if people want to jump in and share it eventually, um, uh, I may cut the sharing short in Psalms, and then just do a little bit in the prophets because there's a whole nother aspect of Adonai that I I think that. Uh, it's good. I mean, we need to see it. We need to understand it so that we can understand how to relate. Now, going back to First Peter and the sufferings of Christ, every, you know, the, there's just so many Psalms that Peter quotes. And I think Mallory did a search on that. And Mallory, I, I, if you wouldn't mind, yeah, go ahead and send me that search that you did on um, the comparing the scriptures in First Peter to uh, the Old Testament, and I know that Scott did that, but he found I think he found one verse and found the connection there, and um, so and and uh, Scott, if you do that, send me what you got also. But I appreciate you all taking that on. Um, and I think that that would be really interesting to, to start comparing that. Because remember, in the New Testament, they don't use all these names for God that they do in the Old Testament. They don't use El Shaddai. They don't use, you know, um, uh, Adonai. They don't use Elohim. They don't use, they just say God for the most part, or Lord. Um, and it and it almost feels like now why would that why would they not do that uh it almost feels like got to the new testament he says you need to dig in and find out what these names mean uh in the present in the new testament so that you can identify who and what of the godhead is moving and doing whatever things that's that's going on there anyway so um so uh, what we've really seen is that this um, Adonai is the one who, for those of you who were in the First Peter class, who is particularly uh, overseeing the things that are going on in the corridor. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm repeating, but I just want to make sure everyone understands this flow. And um, that is not trying to help us uh, through it in the sense of, well, just saving us from it, you know, delivering us out of it before anything happens, before Christ is revealed in us, uh, and, and before we have that fellowship with the, with the sufferings of Christ, um, and manifest Christ as nature within us, uh, to, um, uh, to see to see the different aspects of um, Peter without even trying, uh, the Spirit of God has led us into this name. So uh, let's just uh, let's try to finish off now. We're in um, Psalm 16, and I think last class, gosh, I just barely read a little bit, and then I just I went off. And that's what Mary was referred to because I think I said I just went off and just went almost the whole time without sharing hardly any of it and just said, you know, I'm sorry I'm raving and ranting, but uh, I just felt like the Spirit of God was trying to communicate heart, heart of, heart of the Father and of the Son. So, um, so let's look again in Psalm 16 and let's look at verse 8 now we 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 went through you know verse uh, 1 we started with that and then and he said preserve me oh god um and uh he has uh, and he used the word uh in verse 2 lord which is adonai okay so he's um he's he's been speaking to his adonai and um, so we come down to um, verse 8. So 
again, this is a reference to Christ and him crucified. And um, it is um, uh, showing us uh, the turmoil, and most of these do, but at first, this one begins with him calling out, not like he's freaking out or doesn't trust the Lord, but that he does. And so verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. So I will not be motivated. And remember, we, we talked about that for those of you who were in First Peter class of being motivated by your soul to save yourself to save yourself from the trial, to save yourself from the evildoers, to save yourself from the lies being told about you, to justify, to, to uh, um, appear uh, righteous and not willing to go down into that death the way Jesus did in fellowship with his sufferings then in that way. Um, he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Verse 9, therefore, so... So if you can just picture this, this is Jesus talking about um, Adonai, but he's talking about his father. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and he's talking about confidence that what he is going through is not going to be the end of the whole thing. That while God doesn't, you know, while Jesus, yes, Jesus is resurrected, he, Jesus doesn't go back to all the evildoers individually and say, aha, see, I was the son of God. He doesn't even visit them. He never shows up to them. <clears throat> His glory is that the father got that spirit out of him. And our glory is that Jesus was glorified in that manner in the trial. OK, so he's he's coming from that that point of view and you're he you're at my right hand. I am not I'm not in the depths of despair and um, I will not be motivated wrong. And so he's saying, because I have you there, because I shall not be moved. Two things. I have you as my Adonai and I having that am not going to be moved therefore my heart is glad there is there the lord has joy the lord has something that that you know makes him glad and it's not that god delivered him yet cuz he's not delivered out of it it's not that um he knows that his enemies are going to be punished because that's not his joy, but that he could come to a place of rest, being and trusting the Father or his Adonai, and not be moved. Therefore, therefore, remember I told you that. Well, anytime you see the word therefore, ask yourself, what's it there for? because it's referring back to something just said. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth <laughs> because his glory is to stay in the death and, and, his, and to, to do that. This is all First Peter. To do that in such a manner that um, he does not leave that place and go into self and go into his soul and go into self-pity. All right. So, and my flesh also shall rest in hope. So there it is. There's your rest. And that's a rest in hope. That's not a, that's not a rest in deliverance. That's a rest in hope. Now, just a quick side note for those of you who follow this, because all of this is coming out of the firstborn class. We saw in Egypt that God brought out two groups of people. He brought out the firstborns who the lamb was slain for 
And if that blood hadn't been on, been on the doors and they hadn't eaten that lamb, their firstborn, Israel's firstborn, would have died. So that blood and that eating of the lamb was to bring the firstborn out unto the father. Let my firstborn son go. Um, the second group is Israel, who they just got deliverance out of it. All right? So remember, one group is there, the firstborn is there to glorify the Father in sacrifice coming out of Egypt. The other group there is just simply to be delivered from the trial. Okay? This is the Lord. This also is David. This are, is those in whom uh, is the understanding of why these certain trials happen. Not all trials, these that are called the sufferings of Christ. All right. So, my flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. What? You're going to send it there, though? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's... He didn't say, you will keep me out of hell because I'm the Son of God and I'm righteous and I never did anything wrong and this wouldn't be fair if you did this to me and that and on and on and on and on and on. Well, sometimes the sufferings of Christ and you go through them, they, they can feel like going through hell. But He's not going to leave you there. He's not going to leave you there. The rest of your life isn't going to be that. We think it is. We think that somebody could slander you so bad or slander your reputation or slander your name or slander, you know, destroy your ministry and all that. And that's the end. That's not the end. There's a greater beginning than the one that got you all those things. And that beginning is now you're beginning over as if a death took place and now it's Christ. And now it's, it's you joined to him in a way that you weren't before. You didn't understand. You didn't understand that kind of union. You didn't even understand that, the, that the, the, the God that has been exalted and glorified above every name and every knee shall bow to is a slaughtered lamb sitting on the throne. <clears throat> so there is... Uh, an awakening, but you may go through the sufferings of Christ many times in your life. And if you do, you, the next time, or the next time, you understand more of what this is about. And you're not jerked in every direction, and your mind freaking out, and your emotions out of control. You are with the Lord because your soul shall not be left in hell. Okay. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, well, the holy one is this son that's in us. Thou wilt show me the paths of life. Okay, well, he's showing him those. He is showing him the paths of life. The paths of life is life comes out of death. That's the path of life. Jesus said, except the corn of wheat, John 12, 24, fall into the ground and die, if it doesn't do that, if it doesn't go into death, it'll be just one seed. Jesus will just be Jesus, and that's all the Father will, excuse me, that's all the Father will have. But if it die, if it die in that death, it's going to bring forth not just Christians, more seed after his kind that are meant to fall into the ground and die and bring forth more. <clears throat> All right. Uh, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life in, in thy presence is fullness of joy. So we're back to joy again. Or gladness. Glad He was glad up here. Now he's got joy. <clears throat> I don't, this is very difficult. Um, maybe I've got it in my notes here. It's very difficult to communicate, to convey that there are certain things that bring God joy, that affect Him in that way. 
and they're not the fact that we uh, <clears throat> we bring ten thousands of of sacrifices. It's that we bring one in the right spirit. It's not quantity. It's the quality of of our our selflessness. And um, so it's difficult. But I'm telling you, I. When I read that, two times within those verses, there was that joy. It just blessed me because it was coming not from a place I would have expected. It was coming that there are things that bring joy to his heart that we might call hell. You know, for example, see, we, we, there's, not, there's much to understand yet. There is. We need to all admit that. It pleased the Father to bruise him. That's what the scriptures say in, in Isaiah 53. Why would that be? Well, you should read the scriptures after that. You should see the end result after that. Uh, in fact, the end result after that is similar to some of these verses and some of the other verses in Psalms. All right. So, um, um, so in thy presence, and he's talking about being in the presence of the Lord in the midst of the trial. You, you see, you can, you can see that with the three Hebrew children, you know, because they were thrown in the thing and then they see one like the son of God walking around in the midst. You see that over and over in these different situations where, um, for thou art with me, you know. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know, if in his presence there's fullness of joy and he's with us in the fire, if you will, then maybe there should be fullness of joy. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. All right. So let me read a, a few of the notes. Maybe I've got some of that in here. I'm not sure. In verses 8 and 9, there is a gladness that comes to him. Praise God. What has caused it? It is his proximity to his Adonai in the trial, as well as the fact that he has not failed him. He has not failed him. The greatest, see, the, if you will, the, um, the sufferings of Christ uh, are very much akin to uh, the burnt offering of the Old Testament. The burnt offering was a um, was an offering that was called a sweet savor offering. It was not done for sin or because you messed up or this and that. It was done to just please and gratify God, satisfy God. Um, therefore, he's saying, not that I didn't sin in the trial in the corridor. That's not the issue. The issue is, I didn't fail you. I want this to be a, a whole burn offering, not partial. I want this to be a willing sacrifice, which the burn offering is. I want this to be wholly, whole, wholly given to you. Not H-O-L-Y, but W-H wholly given a whole burnt offering and to go through that corridor as hard as that is and to fail at some juncture will be heartbreaking but we've just we've discussed this before but it's not the end because if you say to god give me another chance he will he will anyway um, then in verse, in, uh, uh, we see his trust. Okay, so that's in uh, verse 
1 and 2, I think. We see his trust in Adonai in the negative and the positive. Verse 10, related to what will not come upon him while in the trial. Verse 11 communicates what he will discover on the positive side while in the trial. Again, there is joy. <clears throat> okay, so verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. In verse 10, we, we uh, related to what will not come upon us while in the trial. Okay. Number 11, verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence of fullest, fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Um, verse 11 communicates what he will discover on the positive side while in the trial again. There's joy over that, both, both, both times. Okay, so <clears throat> if you remember... Um, we, uh, we got into this because uh, that uh, this psalm has a lot of where Peter, the guy who wrote First Peter, was first quoting from in the book of Acts chapter 2. He was quoting a whole bunch of this. Peter was <clears throat> from, from this psalm. And relating it to Jesus is being crucified. All right. So now, now remembering um, some of the scriptures that we've read uh, up to this point, this is Peter using those scriptures. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh. Okay, so here's, here's that story. God, at a certain juncture, <clears throat> came to David and told him that I will, you know, I, from now on, I'm going to set somebody on the throne of Israel. And the understanding of that to, to everyone was um, that there's going to be all these sons and sons and sons, but sons of sons and on and on and on, who would sit on the throne of Israel and they would, they would be as David. Well, anybody know anything about some of those <laughs> those kings that ruled during that time? Let's see. Anybody remember something about Joash? I don't know. Anyway, um, there were there were plenty of kings that were not. I mean, the the first one, uh, Rehoboam, first one out of the box after Solomon. So. Um, so David, before he even dies and before, you know, Solomon dies and this next son comes up that wasn't that, wasn't what he was supposed to be. David, before even Solomon has become king, writes about his version of what he thinks that that promise was about. It was definitely his seed after him, sitting on the throne forever. Okay, so David is dead and his sepulcher is here and he's buried. Therefore, being a prophet and, and knowing, David, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. This is crazy if if you stick with your own mentality of what, well, I thought it was, you know, well, it doesn't matter. What matters is, number one, what God thought of it. And number two, what David, because the promise was to him. And his version of what he got is right here. And then Peter saying, I'm telling you, God 
in saying it, David in receiving it, and me, Peter, in seeing it um, after, you know, centuries, um, we're all in agreement. This is about Christ. All right. So, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, David, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ. This is David speaking of the resurrection of Christ. And here's what Peter's saying. <laughs> He's not saying, well, King David said this, and King David believed this. He's not saying um, uh, that, that little um, shepherd boy said that and believed it, or that, that man of war uh, said that and believes it. And He said, David being a prophet, knew what was coming. Remember that? David being a prophet, verse 30. So, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Verse 32, this is still Acts 2. This Jesus, the crucified one, the one he just described as the crucified one, the one that he just spoke about. Um, this Jesus, the crucified one, hath God raised up. God didn't raise Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. He raised the crucified one from the dead. Because uh, Jesus of Nazareth didn't need to be raising from the dead. But Jesus, the Son of God that went into this death as a lamb, he died, and he was risen, or he was raised. God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Okay, so <laughs> this gets even more interesting because Peter is not just saying, well, I saw it in the Word, and therefore it's true. He's saying, we were his disciples, we saw it. We saw him put to death, and we saw him alive after it. This is the one. This is, this is what David was talking about all along. All right? <clears throat> um, and he, uh, let's see, the, um, this Jesus, the crucified one, hath God raised up, wherefore, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. This, this is, right now these words are just madness. We, to us, they're not. To us, we go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But to the people that, that Peter's talking to, this is madness. There's, Israel, all of them were trained their whole lives and generations upon generations. There's only one God. There's not three in one. There's only one God. But Peter's referring to God hath raised him up. But then he goes on to say that he's at the right hand of God and exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. You got three of them. He's talking about three now. I mean, in a, it's sort of a miracle they didn't rush on him and just kill him right then and there. Blasphemy. But they didn't. They got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit is there testifying of it. <clears throat> so Peter says, this is the, the this is the Father working as the Adonai, raising him up, and then sending the promise of the Holy Ghost that he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. So the Spirit of God is there. That's the difference. You know, you know, we could get this easier if we, if we had the Spirit of God or if we let him, let him 
out of his uh, ark, the dove that was in the ark, we let him out of the ark with all the beasts and all the groaning and all of the fighting and all the stuff going on in that ark and just let him go and he'll bring back evidence and he'll bring us to the new creation, which is basically what Noah entered into because everything was past and this was all new. It was a picture of that. Um, <clears throat> but we have the Holy Spirit a lot of times in our religious box of what he does and how he operates. You know, he's, he's the third person of the Trinity. He's got so much stuff in him you can't even imagine. I mean, I can't even imagine. He's got so much of Jesus that he wants to share. It's mind-blowing. It just goes and 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 goes. When will it stop? Never! Because that's their spirit. That's Elohim's way of relating. So he's going to, you know... And if you can talk him out of talking about Jesus, he'll probably start talking to you about the Father. But if we don't even understand him in the light of those things, and we're just going, okay, well, he's kind of my guide, and he's, you know, he's here to make sure that I um, <clears throat> operate in the gifts of the Spirit and that I can, I can find direction, you know, if I should get married or not. And, you know, all these things that relate to this earth so much just my life and come to me and shine on me so people think I'm spiritual instead of you're not spiritual here's Jesus and it blows your mind and you go okay I love it you know <laughs> see here I go Mary I'm ranting and raving again <laughs> um so he says uh for David is not ascended into the heavens um for he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord. And I, I have that in my, my notes here as Adon. So maybe somebody can check that out real quick because I don't. Um, but it definitely is related to Adonai. Uh, and the only thing I can figure if, if it really is, and I meant to say this too, the Lord said unto my Lord, and that is, Add on, the, there is the Lord, which is the Lord, and then there's the Lord, which is Jesus, uh, who became a man who now has gone through death and has shown that spirit. And he is, as it were, a Lord in the earth. But God the Father says, sit on my right hand. Sit on, thy, on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Let all of the house of Israel know assuredly. That God hath made that same Jesus that was crucified. That bore it in the right spirit that bore it in love for, for those who know not what they do. Whom ye crucified. See, he's not talking to the whole world of sin right now. He's talking about you crucified him. You, and, and we do. When, when we get into the corridor, when we get into that situation, there's a good chance that we would just crucify him afresh in the sense of, we, we just want out of here and we're not going to let you live in us this way. And, you know, you can say anything. I, I, I don't believe in that and all that. You know, well, you'll face it one day when you stand before him as a slaughtered lamb and he's dividing the sheep from the goats. And you'll see what is, what is the real issue of his heart. See, well, I've been good and I went to church my whole life and I did that and that. He's not. I bet you anything you won't ever get asked anything about that. I bet it'll be, well, how'd you treat so-and-so that time? Remember what you did to so-and-so? Oh, you don't? Well, here, let me show you. And just and then we go, oh, my God, don't show me all of that. I thought I got all that forgiven. You continued in that. You continued in that. Now, 
I don't know how familiar you, you are with uh, Romans 6 and uh, verse 1, but it, it, up, to ver, up to chapter 6 of Romans, it talks about the forgiveness of sins and that he died to forgive you of your sins and atonement and all that stuff. It does. It does. Absolutely. That's as far as most Christians get. That's what they know. Starting in verse uh, chapter 6, verse 1, he says, okay, these things being true, that he died for your sins and this and that and that, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? And here's the key. The word sin isn't, shall we continue sinning? Doing sin, the fruit off the tree, shall we continue in doing that? It's saying, shall we continue in that nature, the sin nature? That's what he's talking about. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to be that thing that I that crucified me? Um, so you continue in that, that grace may abound, so that you you can still grace can still abound, and most Christians believe it can, and that's what they do. Okay, and I'm not talking about once saved or always saved or any of that junk. I'm talking about the plan of God that once desires died for and ought to get what he died for. And that is that we be one with him changed into that same spirit. From glory to glory. So. Uh, so we see. We see that he's talking about these things. The same whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked to their heart. There it is. We don't see, we don't see, we, we, we see doctrinally. D Jesus died 2,000 years ago. I believe that. But we don't see Jesus as a person. We don't see him as a person that lives inside of us. We don't see him as a person to whom we go in prayer or whatever. We, because uh, if we did, we would at some juncture go, you know what? You know, that spirit of mine, that way of mine, that, that horrid thing that pierced you, that cuts me to the bone. What is it here? Uh, Prick to the heart. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart. I mean, at some juncture, we have to get out of religion and we've got to get hold of the real Jesus and act like he's real and relate to him as if he's actually in us and should be able to live in us. But we're, see, that was one of the, I need to finish this, but that was one of the, the problems why God sent them into captivity. Because the, you go into the temple and they didn't worship God. They th said they were, but they didn't. And they had all kind of foul stuff in there. You know, you surely you've read Ezekiel. Um, and all kind of foul stuff going on in there. And, um, and God just... <laughs> You know, his presence just got up and left. I mean, he didn't just immediately, he worked his way out. Did you know that? He didn't just get, he, he kind of went, oh, i got to get out of here. So he moved a little further toward getting out. And, and then finally, he left. And the temple was devoid of his life. Now that's hell. Talk about hell. That would be hell. So let me try to just read. I'm just going to try to read now. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and say repentance may not be. See, it wasn't like Peter was going, you know, y'all did a bunch of bad things. You know, you did. Everybody present, per, repents of their bad things. Well, let's see. I need to just name them off and get forgiveness for them. 
the, the greatest one is that you rejected the one that God had been taught. I'm sorry, I shouldn't keep going here, but you need to understand this. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Are you afar off? Well, get this Holy Spirit. You can. He's offering it. Not, not the religious Holy Spirit. Um, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation, this evil generation, this generation. Save yourself from this generation of Adam, of of that nature and let's get with the Lord Paul comes along later on he just starts preaching Christ in you that's your hope that's the thing that this is about okay